morning. I do want to say for the record though, because I did see people last night who said to me, um, I want to ask you something before the alcohol kicks in. I don't actually drink. I just look like I do. I don't actually drink. And, and to this day, I'm the quietest person in my family. So I, I, just, I just want to say for the record. So thank you for the introduction, much appreciated. I want to thank the organizers for affording me this opportunity for the keynote, as well as the opportunity and possibility of meeting and engaging with scholars and researchers around the country here at Rhodes for this Haltasa event on matters in education that are gripping both students and teachers in our country. I've been in conversation, so thanks very much, Kasturi, the team that I've put this all together, um, the Haltasa group, thank you very much. Um, I think we all sort of feel like there's been a lot of discussion and this is exactly what conferences are about. Um, I've been in conversations with many of you in this room, um, some of you more detailed conversations over the past three days, um, and with some, I guess, because I've seen you in other places, I've read your work and engaged with you in conversation. And this has been a continuation, sometimes, of previous conversations. So I want to say, um, I've divided my talk into like four parts. So in case I don't get to all of them, I, I do recognize that, you know, the Haltasa organizing team is very, very keen and, and very diligent about keeping time and also so that we have discussion and you can always reach me afterwards through email if there's something that you feel you wanted me to elaborate on. So I'm, I'm very, very aware of the whole process of, of timekeeping. Our country is big, so I have some time on here. Our country is big. We have histories that intersect and then we have histories about our identities that have not been taught sometimes ignored and better still relegated to identities of shame or ridicule as the most recent downright racial study in Stellenbosch showed and which for that matter received national coverage. So let me say a little bit about my context, right? The context of being here um, and being in conversation with you. The history of my identity because what I do and how I do it is very informed by where I come from. I also have to just say, I don't like reading papers. It's not my thing. People know me as being both theoretical and theatrical. So I like to walk around, I like to look at people, talk to them. So if I go away from the paper, that's the intention. I like to use my hands. I don't want to be looking down at, so that you see my head that hasn't been washed in five days. So I like to walk around, so that's kind of what I do. So, um, what is my history? I was born in District 6, which was called the 6th Municipality of the, of the Cape, right on 56 de Villiers Street, just opposite what is now the, one of the homes of CPUT. Um, my grandfather was a Kosa man from the Eastern Cape, and my grandmother, a woman from a Hindu family, whose ancestors were enslaved by the Dutch. And like you all know, the reason I marked, my grandfather was marked, my grandmother was September, my best friends are October and November, and my cousins are April. Uh, there's, 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 very, there's, there's, there's not much I can do, this is, this is it, right? Um, so yes, I'm the child of a mother who worked in a factory. Um, I, I think some of you know who I know in this room. Um, I just want to say, for me, this talk um, I had to take his name out of it. Muhammad Benjamin died last week Saturday. For those of you from the Cape, I'm busy with his book called From Wolfie to Mecca. I met Muhammad when he was a she and was my babysitter. So I played netball with, I can say the word, with Morphis on the Cape from the time I was eight. Yes, so if, if Kafunta was here now, he would say, Messi, Moisadu. Moisadu. Um, so yes, I, I grew up with a mother who, with sisters who worked in, in, in factories, clothing factories, who could never afford the clothes that they made. So um, I also don't talk about my father's family much, partly because I only met him two weeks before I turned 19. 
um, and his mother has SLAVE on her birth certificate. She was, she's, um, her ancestry is from St. Helena and Mauritius, so not, much, not, not many places for me to go to ignore my history. So I've never changed my name. So my work is informed by Stephen Bantubiko, Franz Fanon, the Black Panthers, especially Stokely Carmichael, Walter Rodney, um, Suleiman Bashir from Senegal, Catherine Dines, who started uh, the Collegium of Black Women in Philosophy, um, Mahoba Ramosi, I'm sure you all know from UNISA, Algerian Jacques Derrida, I like to say that these Algerian people still think he's French. The last time I checked Algeria was in the north of Africa, yes. not the south of France. Yes. Um, Ugandan Mahmoud Mamdani, Sylvia Tamali, Wangara Matai, Anton Lembeli, the Nadal sisters of Martinique, the group of women who uh, pursued um, written work on negritude in, 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 in Paris. Paulette Nadal was the first black woman to obtain a PhD in philosophy from the Sorbonne University. W.E.B. Du Bois, who, by the way, uh, was a contemporary of Charlotte Maclaquet, for those of you who might want to know that. The negritude writers, Amy Césaire, who was Franz Fanon's teacher, Leon de Mas, who was the party goer in the group, Senghor, as you know, from Senegal, um, writers like Elin Siksu, philosophers like Valentin Mudimbi, Pauline Hautinji, Kwame Kiyeki, Nigugi, Wationgo, Mavoho More, who was my colleague, Sabine Park, who's in Germany, Jean-Paul Hockey, who's Corsican and from Guadeloupe, poet and philosopher Tanela Boni from Côte d'Ivoire, Wokuni Kolbese from Ethiopia, Leonard Harris, one of the founder members of Philosophy Born of Struggle, Noah Ha, a Vietnamese German woman who does critical race theory, friends and colleagues that, whose work I draw from, um, Lewis Gordon and others, and my good friend Molefi Asanti. So the list continues. So whilst my talk is on reason and unreason, it is also at the backdrop of the title of the 2019 Haltasa Conference, Pedagogies in Context. The overall South African context of higher education, I believe for black people, is about being conned. That's our context. C-O-N, we're being conned. <laughs> it is a context of deception. I'm not interested in drawing on individual institutions today, you know, mainly universities, I think we all know, um, that we work in places that are either harboring or reproducing the same paradigms of knowledge production, that is, they ignore the conditions under which labor is produced, under which knowledge is produced. The white supervisor who has no idea what the black woman student is doing, and whose only interest is to point out the grammatical and syntax errors, some of you have been there, as a means to ensure that the black student knows that she remains the gatekeeper when it comes to the English language. Let us remind ourselves that it is precisely with language where Fanon starts his interrogation of colonial relations in Algeria between the French colonizer and the Algerian colonized. It is precisely the language that Steve Biko used in creating with others the dearth of knowledge on black consciousness, which became the focus of his trial. Black consciousness language was put on trial. Read through the trial, see how Judge Bossel questions Biko and read what Biko says in response. Today, almost 25 years after the first democratic elections, we continue to work at universities built by slave labor. I want to take a moment to reflect on some of what has been said at the conference. I'm aware that I cannot capture all of the points that have been raised, or those that are of interest to me, as there are many, but I would like to take up one point in particular, which I hope will be addressed as I close. I want to take up the point made by Prof Bauer on Wednesday when he said, to my surprise a little, I do not even know what decoloniality means. I had my hand up to respond to this at the end of the keynote during the question and answer session, but my raised hand was not observed, I think because time dictated that we go to the next session. I will not venture to address Prof Bauer on this, but since his comment has been repeated by many in this room I have been in conversation with, 
I would rather like to offer my reflections on this issue, not about him per se, because it's not about that, but about the discussions that ensued as a consequence of this declaration, which some of you have indicated you have heard many times before from people that you work with. I do this in view of the conversations with colleagues here at Altasso. In my view, part of the reason why we hear scholars and researchers that we work with remark with confused and disgruntled voices about how they are unsure what coloniality means or what decolonial education suggests is because we have a history of illogical reason in our country. Reason does not make sense. Reason, reason that does not make sense at the moment. Reason that defies the very existence of rationality. It is not difficult to comprehend that the colonial, the actual word, is written within the word decolonial. When we say we debone a fish, we're taking the bone out of the fish. When we say we dethrone a kingdom, we're taking the throne away from the kingdom. So to say you don't know what decolonial or decoloniality means is a little bit much, given that most of us in this room speak English because we were colonized by the English. The colonial is present in the word and in our company for the most part, and the colonial is always everywhere in South African higher education. It's not difficult to consult a dictionary if the events of the past five years in the country, spearheaded by student movements, have gone unnoticed by scholars and academic leaders who do not know what decoloniality is. The D, D -E, in decolonial is a prefix, and its dictionary meaning suggests removal, to do away with. So it is not the semantics of the word that is not understood by black scholars, it is rather the implications for addressing the colonizer, the settler colonial, yes. the white liberal who dances to fight the power at the jaw. These are, this is implicated by the attachments of a master-slave relationship that has spanned over centuries and decades, produced conditions for complicity. Where liberation is talked about, but the severing from the master is a tear-jerking travesty for the colonized who do not want to offend their white line manager because the politeness of racism is so crude and yet so sweet and gentle, so perverse and yet so pleasant in its narcissistic silence, so caring and yet complicit, reproducing the very, very system that we claim to be against. This kind of don't rock the boat reason serves the master, not the previously enslaved. It cons the slave because the reason, because reason that shows itself as reason, the way we have experienced it, is unreason or illogical reason. My political argument is that there is nothing more important for democracy than to understand the preconditions for reason. 342 years from 1652 to 1994 is an indication of the length of time, of the generations of servitude and the generations of beneficiaries of settler coloniality, racism and all that apartheid offered the white population for whom beneficiary status was created and still continues. Let me take three particular quotes from Fanon as a way to further this discussion. Fanon says very early on in the book, Black Skin, White Mask, in the course of this essay, we shall address the development of an effort to understand black-white relations. The white man is sealed in his whiteness, the black man in his blackness. We shall seek to ascertain the directions of this dual narcissism and the motivations that inspire it. I want to go to the next one. This he says within the first five pages of Black Skin, White Mask, which was written when he was 26 and published when he was 27. To speak means to be in a position to use a certain syntax, to grasp the morphology of this or that language, but it means above all to assume a culture to support the weight of that civilization. And that, for the most part, is what my talk addresses. It is the whole question of speaking English. It is the whole question of having learned the mannerisms from our colonizer by which to speak English. 
It is the manner in which speech, the spoken word, still dictates how we have that face-to-face, -face, in the flesh, contact and confrontation from the very people who claim to be anti-racist but who still want to prolong their life of coloniality. The Roads Must Fall movement demonstrated to us that learners did not want to be reminded of their colonial past in ways that suggest a memorialized, statuesque gaze towards a colonizer like Rhodes, who they held in contempt and who, as it happens, was given the presence of an omnipotent God during apartheid and upon which their gazes were to remain as fixed and filled with the same gratitude for his colonial deeds as onlookers of the past, who, who for the most part were their oppressors. Learners as such created the conditions for physical space to match the need for social space and pave the way for intellectual space. To be conscious of one's existence in the world is a prerequisite for being in the world. This consciousness of oneself and the environment within which the self is located is what informs our ability to understand our consciousness. For consciousness of self is always, always precedes consciousness of one and consciousness of the other. other. Hegel, who Biko draws on um, in many of his papers collated in I Write What I Like, insists on the subjective moment. As such, consciousness precedes consciousness of the thing, being or surrounding. Self-consciousness, in other words, being conscious of yourself, who you are, of your identity. Remember, Biko does use the word white. He does use the word white liberals, but he also uses words like beneficiary and agent. He connects the white person <laughs> to how they perform their lived experience in the world, the agency and the beneficiary. Self-consciousness is thus the root, the stepping stone to reason, and the latter, reason, the passage to absolute. So my presentation today on race and pedagogy, um, looking at reason and unreason, along with Derrida's white mythology, how it is reproduced at the backdrop of a commitment to, to move our speech, our imagination, our writing, and thinking towards decolonial spaces where reason and unreason feature prominently in our determination to craft decolonial thinking. We are all adults in this room. As adult scholars and researchers working within and alongside centers within universities that claim to focus on critical pedagogy in teaching and learning, our interrogation of the relations of domination, especially white domination, often take us to moments where we cannot accept the friendship of a colleague, whether they are black men or black women, or particularly, often, most of the time, whether they are white men or white women, when it's more than collegiality and friendship for those who are friends and colleagues with people they work with, but it is about political practice. You will have somebody who was nice to you and at the same time says, you know, I don't know what this person is doing here. How did you get this PhD, right? Mm -hmm. um, it's when it's sometimes more than, it's about political practice. When it is not about who you are, as Paul Gilroy says, but where you act. When it is not about your verbal protestations about racism, as Albert Memmi, author of The Colonizer and the Colonized says, but it is about your plan of political action. When it is not about adopting a decolonial framework, but about questioning your settler colonial history and your ability to your ability to recognize that you have work to do if you want to live in a democracy yes. that was built on 342 years of usurpation, settler colonialism, racism, and enslavement built on the backs of black people. Today, as the last day of the conference, and for those who enjoyed their time dancing last night, which I was very happy to do, we are now, for today, back to work, right? We are back to work. And in the, in the days to come, we ask ourselves questions which speak to issues of power and privilege. How long it is going to take for those in positions of leadership, which they have turned into positions of power, to come to terms with their complicity of racism, and secular coloniality, which they claim to be against. How long will it take 
for your white colleagues to stop acting as though you are making them feel uncomfortable. Because there's an assumption that their discomfort is hurtful, much more hurtful than your enslavement. And we all know that a happy master is a master who reproduces and perpetuates racism and servitude. So if you're feeling uncomfortable, white folks, feel uncomfortable. So we are not here to make anyone comfortable or happy. It is not our job. It is our job to persevere and get on with the bigger issues. Yes. The bigger issues of how do we conduct ourselves yes. in higher education mm -hmm. in our country. Mm -hmm. How do we produce African scholarship mm -hmm. where there are still severe problems with the very conditions mm -hmm. under which black people work in universities. Mm -hmm. In other words, the conditions for your mind labor. Mm -hmm. Conference are about engagement, discussion, confrontations, interjections and arguments that we are not expect there's an assumption that we are not expected to disagree with one another it is also about challenging ourselves and being challenged i'm very much aware that there has not been a day of mourning for the end of white supremacy in south africa because it has not ended nor has there been a burial for the end of apartheid to give white folks the closure they needed but i'm not going to sit around or stand around or dance around or be around with anyone who does not take their agency seriously. Settler coloniality offered us many reasons why black people had to be subjugated, and apartheid had given even more to further build. And now, in 1994, the reason for being white seems to have vanished, and white folks have transitioned into an unreason without the slightest awareness that we are here, there, everywhere, watching, observing, participating, as they navigate their ownership, entitlement, over and over and over again, without any indication that they have learned from the lessons of our past. When Mangoliso Robert Sabukwe, who would have been 95 years old, I think next week, he was born on the 5th of December, 1924, he walked out of the 1955 meeting to discuss the Freedom Charter because he did not believe that a document articulating the basis for a national liberation struggle, one which was called the Freedom Charter, should avoid the obvious, and that is to articulate the reason for its presence, right? To articulate and situate within its writtenness and name the colonizer. Instead, the South African Communist Party contingency, who had strategically befriended the learned group of lawyers in the ANC, asserted that the opening clause of the Freedom Charter should say, we the people of South Africa declare for all our country and the world to know that South Africa belongs to all who live in it, black and white. This is simply illogical. This is illogical reason, right? Um, so who we left? We know why Sabukwe was called prof. He was a teacher. He was called prof by all of the black consciousness and the PAC scholars and thinkers. When Bika walked into a room and saw Sabukwe, he said, God is here, right? And what he meant by that is if you look at, um, when we talk about reason, look up definitions of reason and truth. It talks about God. It talks about making the word flesh. In other words, it says, make your word be a reflection of your body. Make your word be the reflection of your agency. I am not interested in guilt. I am not interested in anybody talking to me about how I make them feel uncomfortable. I can only be friends with white folks who take their agency seriously. This is about the bigger issue. The bigger issue from the Freedom Charter then went to the Constitution. Uh -huh. When we have a bigger form of illogical unreason as reason, what do we have? We have, I can read you what the Bill of Rights says, um, but I have other examples to go to. What it does is completely erase 50% of the population who were your colonizers during apartheid. Mm. It takes white women out of the historical complicity and participation and reproduction of the system of apartheid and puts them with black women, mm. right? Mm. And this is exactly what illogical unreason is. It's illogical unreason. So when people tell me, I don't understand, 
Honey, I know what you mean. I know what you mean. Because we have a country that offers us illogical concepts. If we are to think beyond the limits of our history, how can we do that? When Lewis Gordon talks about shifting the geography of reason, he's not saying taking reason out of Africa, I'm oh, sorry, out of Europe. He's saying, let's think on the basis of where the colonizer is thinking. Mm. But let's, sorry, uh, the colonized is thinking, mm. right? Because nobody is interested in where the enslaved thinks, mm. right? Nobody's interested in that. When Fanon says, every time I was in a room, reason left. Mm. Right? Look at black skin, white mask, wretched of the earth. He says that in there. So my concern as I go through some of the other segments here is to pay attention to the relationship that speech has to language, the relationship that the speaker has with upholding English colonization because we speak English. We have to address ourselves in English. We have to make meaning of the world in English. I want to read to you very quickly what Lord Macaulay said to the British Parliament in 1835, right? And you all know what the Berlin Conference did, right? In 1880, 1884, right? How Africa was carved up and divided. He says, Macaulay says, I've traveled across the length and breadth of India. Sorry, I've traveled across the length and breadth of Africa. And I have not seen one person who is a beggar, who is a thief. Such wealth I have seen on this continent, such high moral values, people of such caliber, mm. that I do not think mm. we would ever conquer this country, mm. he's referring to South Africa and Zimbabwe, mm. unless we break the very backbone of this nation, mm. which is a spiritual and cultural heritage. And mm. therefore, I propose that we replace her old and ancient education system, mm -hmm. her culture. Mm -hmm. For if the Africans think that all that is foreign and English is good and greater than their own, they will lose their self-esteem, mm -hmm. their native culture, and they will become what we want them, a truly dominated nation. Mm -hmm. So folks, what have we done? Exactly. Okay, so let me just move quickly to Paulo Freire and Jeff Derrida and talk about critical pedagogy and white mythology, right? So Freire's critical pedagogy rejects the notion that knowledge is apolitical. It says that knowledge is never neutral, it is always political. That teaching is inherently a political act. This is what Freire says in Pedagogy of the Oppressed whether the teacher recognizes it or not. That the context of social justice and democracy can never be separated from the act of teaching and learning. So let me take you to Jacques Derrida, right? He asks in his, in his, in his uh, paper, what? How can it be 10 minutes? It's nine o'clock. <laughs> Okay, um, he says, um, a white mythology, he so he's asking the, answering the, asking the question, what is metaphysics? A white mythology which assembles and reflects the Western culture. The white man takes his own mythology, that is Indo-European mythology, his logos, that is the mythos of his idiom, for the universal form of that which is still inescapable <coughs> desire to call reason, right? So Logos is often referred to as the word of God, the divine principle, um, whether you do philosophy or not. Metaphysics is just a branch of philosophy that examines the fundamental nature of reality. Speaking in English, reading in English, and teaching in English, in English-speaking countries, means adopting an approach to learning that is linked to the British Empire. As South Africans, we know too well how our apartheid curriculums fostered English superiority and black servitude. From Shakespeare's Caliban to, to Jane Eyre's Bertha Mason, let alone Othello, right? These were set texts for high school learners. Black subjectivity enters the text either as invisible or oversexed and mad. Caliban is oversexed. I 
And of course, Bert Bertha Mason, the Creole from Jamaica, she's mad. She wants to burn people in her beds, right? Um, so, yeah. So the learner understands very early on that black subjectivity only features in the literary imagination as enslaved. But it is not only about learning a language, it is about the gestures, the nuances, the style, the mode of speaking, the mannerism, and what for now clearly identifies as the language of your civilization, right? How many white folks do you know who use the word usurped? When Walter Rodney wrote How Europe Underdeveloped Africa, he was asked by publishers um, to remove certain words because there was an assumption that the average person would not understand that the vocabulary, the vocabulary within the book. This is based on the assumption that there are no words in any vernacular that situates the process whereby an uninvited guest sails into your country, in this case the Cape, and takes your land, right? So I, I make a point of always telling students when Walter Rodney talks about how Europe underdeveloped Africa, that they know that the continent was rich, the continent was never poor, nobody runs after a man with broken shoes, right? Yeah. We know that. So they wouldn't have been interested in the African continent if it was not rich. So I always tell students, stop saying that we're poor, we were impoverished. You know, yes. things were taken away from us. Yes. Why would Europeans come here? Right. right? Why would they decide to, yeah. to divide up the continent? And I say this because they need to produce work and think beyond the limitations exactly. of that apartheid education, Teach. right? Teach. We teach in English in any given place in South Africa because that place, that site of learning has been and often remains a site of British colonization. Likewise, for those who teach in French and other languages, we find ourselves locked, other European languages locked, in a tight colonial grip, unable to untie the many knots which we often call tradition, or better still, scholarship. Each a trajectory of teaching and learning that we inherited from our predecessors and within which many remain invested despite their revolutionary repertoire. Hey, how many Amazonians do you meet? Ne? And then the very next day they say, oh yes, my line manager. Hello, hello. I'm thinking you were just in hospital. You just had a breakdown and you're still playing the same game, yeah. right? So this leaves us working within an inescapable paradigm of thoughts, ideas, metaphors, language, knowledge that locks us into a form of reason. And as such reasoning and from which a decolonial project in broader terms, especially from its early anti-colonial roots, demand that we think outside of the very colonial language that instilled its coloniality within us. Here I will in brief examine the two approaches. I have, I have some examples here. Um, how Jacques Derrida is often referred to as the father of deconstruction. Um, his interrogation is not only of social and political thought, but more pronouncedly of philosophy. He interrogated the written word of philosophy and in the process produced an approach to unraveling, what I call um, the basis of deconstruction is unraveling the hidden, the forbidden, and the repressed, right? So what does that say to us? What is the history of Jacques Derrida? Born in 1930, 1940, Vichy comes guns blazing into Algeria, right? Derrida and his family classified as indigenous Jews, right? And so what happens? Mm -hmm. Only a certain small percentage can stay in the school system. Jacques Derrida is kicked out, right? And so he goes to school, he goes to, the, to school the following year, and throughout his life, especially when he goes to Paris, he has that nervous breakdown. Why? Because his face was the overwhelming presence of the empire, right? This is how the empire has an impact on him. He's told he doesn't speak French properly. He's told he has to leave his Algerian ways behind. In fact, for those of you who have read uh, Benoit Peter's book on Derrida, look at how he opens. Look at the first chapter. It's called, it's called Negus, N-E-G-U-S. Sounds very much like the U.S. expression. So despite <laughs> everything that Jacques Derrida has done, more than 70 books, I should know, I have all of them. Yes? Yes? Or after all, everything that he's done, how does he enter that text? Chapter one, Negus. Right? So Peters, Peters evokes the fact that Jacques Derrida was called this. Right? And what does negus mean? N-E-G-U-S. 
it basically means black Jew, uh -huh. right? In the context of Algeria at the time, but it is also a word used in Ethiopia to talk about the black kingdom, the Semitic kingdom, right? Um, I want to try and go through some of my examples. I'm going to miss huge pieces here, but let me just say, my critique of reason and unreason within teaching and learning questions the very act of teaching and the very act of learning, for they are political acts. They are political acts not only in South Africa, where the historical antagonisms that emerged out of apartheid education continues to reproduce itself in an era of democracy, but in many societies where racism is alive and well. In the past decade especially, students have demanded a decolonial education, challenging the physical... Sorry, I'm going to cut that. Um, so, for Derrida, there are two parts here in terms of um, inversion and inversion, because to speak of pedagogy is to situate curriculum, methodology, and technique as its cornerstones. Um, I want to talk about some of the willful ignorance some of the narcissistic rage. How many of you have encountered that with your colleagues? Um, you know, that's masked in many other different ways. But also question the way that teaching and learning is done and why it is crucial to the decolonial project that we unpack our site of knowledge within and outside of the university. We unpack the sites where we, we reproduce from, the conditions under which we walk in our corridors and do our work, the places where we encounter the tense white middle class moment. Ever address a colleague and you, and you ask yourself, oh my God, what have I just done? Because there's absolute silence, silence. right? The same person who goes to your house for dinner, but who's not, who you work with, who you've written with, but who's not able to address her own racism. Mm. This is what we find all the time. Mm. So I think for the sake of, of, of this, um, I want to maybe just share some examples with you, and you can ask me about it afterwards. <laughs> I'm going to um, basically summarize these examples. So, um, I brought classroom examples here to share with you. Um, one, one which um, happened in Canada, and the other who, that happened at my university. And um, what I want to say is that during a particular workshop session, is this for on? Uh -huh. Yes? No? Okay. Um, is it okay now? All right. Yes? Um, when um, a, a black woman had given an example of her experience of racism, um, a white woman, this is in Canada, and I, I use this example because it's very similar to the example I experienced two years ago in 2017 said to this black woman, I have no idea what you're talking about. I don't understand. And she said, um, for some of you who've read Race and Pedagogical Practices, now I just sound like I'm on drugs. <laughs> um, so she says, she, says, she says to her, you know, I have no idea what you're talking about. I cannot imagine this racism. I cannot imagine it, right? When she's confronted by me, she says, I don't have the words to say it. This is a highly regarded um, uh, person who was doing a second PhD. Let me just be clear, right? And there's a sense in which, um, from my experience, I'm closer to 60 than I am to 50, where people say, but you're so well-dressed, but you wear pearls, you couldn't possibly have experienced that oppression, right? And so it's always about how we look, that we don't look like we were from the previously enslaved. We don't look like we're oppressed. We're not taking their old clothes that they have hidden under their bed because that is the gesture of goodwill, right? The Oxfam gesture. So this happens across the board. At my university, um, I said I wasn't going to name the other names, but I'll name this one. Um, I had a scene, um, a, a situation, and I've changed the name of this person. I call her Ophelia. Lovely person in Shakespeare, right? Um, so she asked me, I'm wondering if you can assist me with the student. And I said to her, uh, what do you want my assistance with? She's on the phone. And she says, um, the student doesn't know how to write. Um, and I also do writing workshops for, for those of you. Um, yeah, I, I do writing and research workshops. Um, uh, I've, I've done it across the country. I also write fiction, yes? Um, and so I said, well, how long have you worked with the student? She said, about six months. I said, what is the topic? So she's in architecture, by the way. She says it's on African identity and architecture. 
Um, I said, have you spoken to her about what you've identified as some of the work that she needs to do? Oh, yes, she said. She doesn't get it. She talks endlessly, but there's no clear understanding of what she's doing. So I say, does the student know that you're speaking to me about her work? <laughs> oh, yes, I told her um, that I was going to refer her to you. So as I read through the work of the student, I noticed how the passages which suggest that critical race theory is key to the overall analysis of the work was missing. She, was just, she just scratched them out. She just said, this is not relevant, this is not relevant. I picked up the telephone and asked about the passages that were deleted, and I said I wanted to see her, because if I'm going to do this, I want to do this face to face. My colleague replied that she did not think that critical race theory should be in architecture. Oh, wow. So she said, we are talking about the built environment here. This is about buildings, not about racism. She's trying to bring racism in places that they don't really belong. I know that you do work on critical race theory, but my thought was that she should come to the writing workshops and research workshops that you conduct um, because the student should really be attending to her grammar. So when I met with the student and heard what the student had to say, I was not shocked. Few things shocked me. It became evident that the problem was not with the student's writing. It was the fact that the lecturers somehow believed that the construction of race takes place outside of the construction of buildings. Mm -hmm. Every building in mm -hmm. South Africa, around the world, mm -hmm. has a history. Every building has a foundation. Mm -hmm. And that foundation reflects the history of the country, mm -hmm. the demarcation of the city, the soil upon which it is built the history of those who told the soil, and the history of those who inhabited. When I took the matter back to her, she tried to suggest that I do not know much about architecture. I said, yes, I agree. Well, then why did you ask me to read the student's work? <laughs> she was silent. So I said, I'm not here to serve as a buffer between you and black students, um, who you think can, you can send to me for a writing workshop when you are the one who needs to have a workshop on understanding the yeah. history of your profession. Yes. Of what you get paid to do. A profession that worked hand in hand to serve the interests of the apartheid regime and which, because of your mother's involvement in Black Sash, somehow exempts you from taking any form of responsibility of entrenching black servitude. You are the one with the problem here, not her. You are the one that has not understood the history of 342 years of colonialism, and you are the one who still perpetuates it. Mm. She burst into tears. Mm. At this point, I think if I hear another word about white fragility, I'm going to pull my hair out. <laughs> so what I usually say to people who ask me, have you read it? I know who the person is, I know the work. You know, but go and read Biko's work on white conscience. You know, yeah, listen to what Biko says about white liberals. Uh, way back in the 1960s and the, 19, uh, in the 1970s, you know, um, and, and, and besides, I have never met a white fragile woman. The same white fragile woman who upholds privilege and power. Come on, give me a break. Mm. So this is what my colleague then writes to me in an email, um, even though I asked her if we could meet. Mm. She says, dear Rosina, and I'm, I use this example because it's similar to the example in Canada. I don't know what to say. I simply have no words. I've not slept much in the past six days. Yes, you're right. I've never thought about race and racism. My mother has taught me not to talk about race. Mm -hmm. Yes, and you're right. I have not been taught by one black person ever, mm. ever. Mm. I am the same age as you, but I cannot ever say that I have had words to address you when you have asked me to look at myself. Mm. I don't know how to do that. I've worked with black students before and I have black friends, and there has never been a problem. I only recently started having black colleagues, and I have got along with them well. What you've asked of me is beyond my scope of understanding, and yet you seem not to believe me. I'm embarrassed. If I have to be honest, I feel inadequate. I do not have the words, just like that, as easy as it, you seem to find them, to address the situation or any other others that you now landed on my door. I'm upset, but then again, I think you upset a lot of people. I have no words. I really have no words. Please understand that I cannot talk about this anymore. And by the way, I, I, I just want to say I have lots of other examples and continue discussion if I see you outside or if you want to talk about reason and unreason. Um, the last point I wanted to make, she won the award for teaching and learning. Really? Oh. Wow. Anyway. So, um, shall I 
I'm just end here. And um, I'm also happy to send people readings of people that I mentioned in the work. Um, and if I can put this together, which I didn't finish, I'm happy to send it off as well. Thank you.